Good afternoon, uh, good evening, or good morning, wherever in the world uh, you may be. My name is Will O'Neill, and I am the host and also a panelist on our panel on death in games. I am joined by some lovely fellow panelists who I'd like to maybe start by throwing it over to Weather Factory. Introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Lottie. I'm one half of Weather Factory. We're the narrative team who made Cultic Simulator. Uh, I'm Alexis. Uh, I'm also Lottie. I mean, I'm the other half. And my name is Kajan, and I um, am director of Lambic Studios. Thanks, everybody. Uh, before we start, I'd like to thank Ludonericon for having us and uh, remind everyone to uh, please check out our games. Uh, everything's on sale. And uh, if you like what we have to say about Death and Games and how we work with it, uh, our games are even better than us talking on this panel. But we'll return to that a little bit later. We've got sort of four big questions that we kind of collectively came up with that we thought would be kind of interesting to discuss as people who develop these kinds of games. And the first one, just to kick us off uh, in the most logical, straightforward way would be, how do each of us use death in our games? How do, how do we feel about the use of death and, and what are we trying to achieve with it and, and how do we kind of work with it in, in our narrative design? So I, I think I'll start with you guys over at Weather Factory. The first game I made, it was very nearly impossible to die. So that was Fallen London. And the setting of Fallen London is um, that London has been dragged below the surface and death is absent for reasons. But the um, structure for London is that it's an endless free-to-play game where you keep on exploring more stories. So we never, I never wanted to kill anyone, uh, make them start over. So the only place in the game that you could die, and I assume this is still the case, so I haven't worked in Fallen London for three years, is there is one particular quest where, as an afterthought, and the whole quest is notoriously punishing and miserable, it says, at this point, you can elect to destroy your character uh, by ascending with the sunlight and being gone. And it says there's no, there's no interesting text behind the cups. Nothing will happen. This isn't a trick. It will just destroy, potentially, the years of work you put into the character. So to my knowledge, three people did that. And in order to get to that point, you needed to have played, uh, you know, at least a year of the game. And then the first one who did it, they, they, um, that code had never been tested. So the character wasn't actually destroyed. So the right person had very politely reported the bug and asked if we could destroy the command of them. So that was, that was how, how I uh, called London work. The Sun of Sea, death was the, um, the thing that made the game feel menacing. And then Cultist, I guess, it's the same. I, I like permadeath games, both to play and to design, because they lend a sense of jeopardy that's very hard to get in games very often. Mm. <laughs> And Lottie, anything you want to add to that? I think he's covered it. I'll save my, my comments for, for later. Okay, and over to memory of God. Cool. Um, so I was actually quite confused when I was asked to take part in this panel because my first thought was, what do I know about death in games? But then when I thought about it, I realized that actually death has played a major role in all of my games to date. Um, without me really being conscious of it, it just kind of death seemed to kind of naturally just seep into the, into the, into the game. Um, and I think like Alexis said, it's really great for just creating this kind of um, menacing feeling, which <clears throat> for whatever reason I, I'm kind of interested in creating. Um, so it likes stillness, it's my, um, stillness of the wind is my uh, most complex game today. Um, so that has death, um, a few instances of death, which are all a little bit different. Um, so you have the the, the play, playable character who um, it's not really made clear um, whether the main character can die or not. Um, that's kind of left um, ambivalent. Um, the the narrative in the game has um, a few deaths. Some that happen during the narrative, and some that um, kind of before the narrative took place. And uh, really difficult not to spoil anything, but death, you know, a lot of things die in, uh, in stillness. Um, but I think the most interesting um, instance of death um, in stillness is actually the, um, the goats on your farm, which actually don't really form part of the narrative. I think it is the most um, affecting instance of death, purely because the player actually has um, a hand in whether the goats die or not. 
And and if if they do, if the player ha- hasn't kind of looked after their uh, goats well enough, and they do die, it's it's kind of it's 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 quite affecting because it was up to them, right? And and the the goats were kind of under their care, and and they neglected them, and they died. Um, and I, I think um, that was really interesting for me because death, kind of as a in the narrative, was kind of very important. But actually, in the end, it was the kind of um, the deaths that don't exist in the narrative exist purely in the gameplay, and um, for me, were, were kind of the most um, the most interesting deaths, and I think got the most reaction. You know, when when you're kind of just pottering around the farm, and you one day you you see that your your goat has just collapsed on the floor because you didn't feed it. I think it's, it's quite a, a shocking um, shocking point in the game. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, you know, for myself, I mean, when I was thinking about this question, I was worried that kind of my answer almost felt a little bit like a cop out because I feel like for me, I'm mostly interested in death as an agent of change for the characters that I'm writing. And I think a question that I'm always kind of interested in as a writer is one of whether or not there are like circumstances where death of one kind or another is preferable to life, or to put like a a finer point on it, is it better to die than it is to have a certain piece of you die? Is there something that is so important to a character that they would, you know, rather die than, than, than see it go on? And that's just basic kind of like writing, you know, with narrative stakes as high as you can. And like in actual sunlight, which was a, you know, a character study about suicidal depression, that's a pretty obvious way of, of confronting that issue of death. But in something like Little Red Lie, my second game, um, you know, only several of the main characters actually die. But I think you could argue that I, I basically killed everybody. I mean, I tried to kill everybody. And that a lot of the people in that game who are still living in the end have it arguably worse than some of the people who don't. So I'm interested in those kinds of questions of death. And is it, is it better or worse in some circumstances to die or lose a point or to lose a point of view or lose a part of you that's important? And um, I mean, to open up the discussion, I'd be interested in your thoughts of the, on that. You'd all kind of you know, touched on this idea of just permanent suffering rather than death is maybe even worse than death because in something like the stillness of the wind obviously you know spoilers oh by the way are we are we all doing spoilers here everyone's spoiling everything correct yes i think i think think we all have to spoiler characters in our games die that's why we're here um or or worse so in the stillness of the wind obviously the death of the main character comes at the peak of significant trauma and significant loss and you know in something like cultist simulator um, from a supernatural perspective, there are things that I think are way, way worse than dying, like the associate, the, the various eldritch horrors to which one can find oneself in. So how, what does everyone feel about that idea of sort of like death versus, you know, in a biological permanent sense versus things that are not death, but maybe worse than dying and, and how we sort of use the tension of that and death against each other? I think it occurs to me hearing you, you talk that there's death as extinction and there's death as grief. And if your character dies in a game, that's, that's the end of your experience. Not necessarily, uh, but it tends to be. That's the convention. If yeah. uh, an NPC dies, then that, that happens often to allow you to experience grief or satisfaction if you really don't like them. But, but, but death is treated um, as more than a basic mechanic, um, as something that touches on, on experience in the real world. Our experience of death is mostly an experience of grief because if we die, we're not around to experience mm. anything. But of course, in games, you get a middle space where your character isn't exactly you, so you can often experience. Well, I think that's a really interesting point because when Kajan was saying earlier about the goats being one of the most empathetic moments where, where, where that death, even though it's the death of an animal, not, not of you, like that really hits home, I think that's because the, the player feels responsible for those goats. It feels like, like they have made a decision that has led to the death of an animal. And most people like animals and most people want to look after stuff and, and do it well, right? And when you're a player character, the player knows they're not going to die if their character dies in the game. So therefore they have some sense of ownership over their own self as like an avatar in, in, in the game space, as it were. Um, so I think, I think you're absolutely right that the death that we actually experience in games is either actual death of the character and we stop playing, but, but we don't want that as, as game makers, right? The last thing we want is people to be like, well, I died, I'm going to move on in the way we would if, if death were real. Um, what we actually want people to experience is a sadness or a feeling of failure or something emotional that, that is represented by death rather than the actual end of things, which I think death, I mean, as somebody who doesn't believe in God, I think death is the end of all things. And that's literally the last thing that I feel that would be fun 
in in a, in a game. But anyway, I'm leaping ahead. Well, I think um, I think in, in well in real life, right? Death is the end of all things, and it's it's coming. Um, it's it's going to come to all of us eventually. But um, the Happy inter- Friday. <laughs> The interesting thing about um, video games, right, is that, like you said, when when whoever dies, even if it's the player character, the game doesn't end, right? Um, in in the majority of games that use death, usually use them as just a fail state, right? So you die, and then the player understands that, okay, well, I can just respawn again. Yeah. Um, and it, it kind of it, it takes. I don't know, it kind of warps this idea that we have of death, I think, in a, in a really interesting way. So in, in my games, I've used death in the, in the most maybe obvious way um, in that it's the end of the story, right? I think like death is just a natural full stop to any story. Um, and that's how I've used it in the past. But I think something like cultist um, is different in the sense that it's, death isn't a full stop, right? And um, you're kind of playing with this idea of, of that, that circle of life and death and life and death, um, which I think is is really interesting. And, and the fact that you're not acknowledging that death happens, it's not just like in a regular game where you die and then you respawn and kind of everyone just kind of glazes over it. Um, in cultists, you're actually um, being aware of the fact that the player dies, right? And then something comes after that. And I think what's interesting too is like, I feel like you can almost have a greater sense of ownership in the continuity of NPCs like the goats who kind of go on without you. Like you feel like, okay, your character has passed away. You're finished with the game. The character you were inhabiting is finished with the game. But what happened to those poor goats? I mean, it's like, it's in a way they feel realer than you or the character that you inhabited, not only because they've ended, but because there's a sense of innocence to it, not just because they're goats, but because there's a sense that they, they had no agency within the framework of the game. So I think, I, think, I think that's really interesting, how you can almost connect more to the idea of NPCs that go on, and you imagine that, they're kind of, that their lives continue within what is essentially a series of ones and zeros. There's, yeah. there's been a lot of games like that. But I think, I mean, uh, go, go ahead, on. please. No, you. I was just going to say, it's, it's, it's rare that um, I, I allow a panel to pass without paying tribute to FTL, the subset game. And one of the things about FTL is you have small humans or, or aliens wandering around a, a ship, and you've taken control over them and you're responsible for protecting them. Um, and they're quite hard to replace. And they're named. But all they are is a name and a health bar. But if, if one of them dies, you really care about it. Mm-hmm. And that death stays with you if you play for another two hours. You're still remembering the character that died at the beginning. Whereas if, if your primary avatar dies, it's a reset and you're on to the next one. Or, or it's a reload, of course, is the other way that, that death and games have trivialized necessarily even further. I was also just going to add, I think it's also interesting how the opposite can kind of have a lot of gravity and weight too. I was thinking about um, the first Red Dead Redemption, where upon the death of the your first player character, you immediately um, become, the player character immediately inhabits his son. And that is really interesting because, okay, the game goes on, but now you are actually forced to you know, sort of carry the memory and the pain of the protagonist that you had just inhabited. In a way, it would have been easier to let them go and for the game to end there. But now, uh, you know, you're off on that quest uh, for redemption. So it's, it's crazy how death can work in, in either direction to, to make it easier or harder for a player. Yeah, I, I think like, you know, with games, you can go one of two ways. You, you can either have um, kind of linear narrative um, or you can have a kind of replayable um, you know, a replayable game that you keep playing over and over and over again. But I think in either case, I think when, if there is death in the game, you know, if you're use, using a death as a failure state or death um, in the narrative, I think the game is is is, um, is better for acknowledging that, right? Mm-hmm. In some way, I mean, the most obvious one is that comes to mind is Dark Souls, right? Where the actual um, death and respawn um, is built into the law of the world, right? It's not, the respawn as a mechanic isn't just kind of a gaming mechanic. Um, Well, it is, but they've also given it this kind of narrative, um, this law aspect, which I think just by acknowledging the fact that, yeah, you're dying and you're coming back to life, um, you know, however way you do it, if it's linear or kind of um, as a fail state, I think it's just 
any game is better for kind of acknowledging it for what it is because it is a massive massive deal um and you know at the end of the day you know death and what happens after we die is one of the like the biggest questions that you can actually ask you know just in general um so i think it's it's a, it's a massive thing to to deal with and it is, is a massive thing to glaze over you know if you're not dealing with it but it's still present you know and thinking about you know dark souls and how again death is sort of a uniquely woven into the mechanics of that game that's a great segue into our next question which is you know what are some of the unique and mechanical ways uh that all of you have sort of expressed and worked with death in your games so again we'll we'll start with weather factory yeah cultists your character um either dies or doesn't die at the end of the game. So since we're talking spoilers, in a way, I guess, Cultist is, 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 is the mirror image of a, a lot of the kind of things you're talking about because um, rather than asking the question, what are, would, would you die rather than endure? Or what would you endure rather than... It asks, what would you endure rather than die? So the three main victory parts are ways that your character become immortal at the cost of... Um, a, a number of experiences um, uh, and potentially ethics and potentially people. And you can also um, uh, choose a variety of ways out and, and, and one of the ways that you can die is strongly implied, uh, uh, implied or not outright status uh, to be depression getting the best of you. But when you die, and I wish I'd had a chance to do more with this, but Cultist was a, a, a game made in less than a year. It's, a lot of, of, of odd bits in it. When you die, your character lives on in your next character's background. Uh, if you're playing a doctor next time round, then you find notes in the case of your previous character. Uh, if you're playing the, uh, uh, the priest character uh, in the upcoming DLC, then you can find that your predecessor set up the cult that mm. you're now heading. So uh, calling that death as grief, I think, is probably a bit... Um, uh, a bit overweening because it, it, I didn't have that gravity in mind at the time. But I wanted to think of ways where you, your avatar unambiguously ceases to be relevant because they move on to a higher state because they're immortal up in the world now or because they, they die. But that you have an effect on, um, uh, on, on what happens next. Because again, you know, as... as, as as you said earlier, we all die, but we all get to decide something about what we leave behind and our life becomes some of our actions. Well, I think you also, that's an idea that you developed from Sunless Sea in a way. Um, yes, of course. Something I was going to say earlier, I think you mentioned it well. Um, death is, is absolutely a fact of every single person's life and either people ignore it and, and deal with it when they're older or they turn to spirituality or, or whatever you know, something that, that humans don't like thinking about but have to at some point or other. Um, and one of the big things that I consistently see make people feel better about the fact that we're all going to die is this idea of lineage, whether that's, you know, you, you have children because they will carry your genes forward and they will carry your bloodline, or whether it's you want to really do good in the world and leave the world a better place than when you were born into it. Whatever it is, you want to leave your mark in some way. Um, and and some of the see... Uh, was, was all about lineage. Um, you were expected to die, uh, but the idea was that your death would leave some, some kind of boon for the character that came after you and inherited that to help you on your journey, which, which you know, establishes the fact that death obviously was, was upsetting and in particular cases can be very frustrating because you could have spent you know, tens of hours on this, on this run and then die and that's really annoying, but you've left something for, for the person who comes after you. And you also actually started some of the, my favorite, you could start with multiple like end goals you could choose. And the one that I always picked and, and really resonated with me was finding your father's bones. So you actually start the whole game with the sense that death has already occurred. You're then set up mechanically um, to, to desperately try not to die but knowing inevitably that you will. But death is, is both, it's kind of through everything and about everything, but it's, it's played with in multiple different ways, which I thought was really interesting. Now over to Mary Gott. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think I've, I've touched on the ways that I've um, personally used death um, in games. Um, yeah, I think... <laughs> Uh, I don't know what else to say. I mean, I think, you know, the thing, I mean, just to, to 
talk a little bit about, you know, my games and how I work with them. I mean, again, I always worry that my answer is like, I, they feel like a cop out, but the thing that I value most about game mechanics and interactivity in general, honestly, is the expectation on the part of the player that they are in control of anything at all. Like the fact that players are primed inherently by the medium for the idea that they're in control of something gives me the opportunity to subvert that expectation. And that's really relevant to how I kind of work with death. Because I do think like interactivity and like the mechanical empathy of having to go through it, like actually move a character on the screen um, or, you know, or move, move a boat or a submarine as the case may be. Like I want players in my games to kind of feel over time that they're moving in quicksand. That like what they're doing is a part of what's going on, but that they're also not really in control of it whatsoever. And I think there's a that's a powerful feeling to inflict on something, and it's not something that you could ever do in a non-interactive medium. And it's a really good way of driving a story towards themes and ideas of death. Like I'm interested in stories about inevitability. Um, I think that dovetails perfectly with how a player goes through a linear experience. And like their interaction with the player character makes them kind of an agent in the inevitable thing that happens. Um, the interesting question to me about mechanics specifically is how do you create that feeling and how do you sort of draw it out, that sense of dread mechanically? Like we use a lot of space, we use a lot of like time, distance. Um, I think back to like Silent Hill 2 and that first run through the fog and like why does that work? Like why does that long, slow, boring, wide shot run create that feeling of ominousness and death? And I feel like in, in all of your games, you were, you're also using slowness, big spaces, and big distances to create that feeling of inevitability and dread as well. And I thought maybe just talking about that, like the atmosphere and how mechanics work into creating an atmosphere of death and, and foreboding. So certainly in, in like Sunless, it's, it's clear. But I'd be really interested in your thoughts on how you do that in a card game and what limitations it imposes and, and how you feel about that. Well, I think it comes down to, to fragility. Um, you know, in a survival horror game, you, you tend not to start off with like a bazooka. You tend to start off with no weapons and probably low health. And you don't know what's going on and you're very vulnerable. And often you end up with like a sort of young woman uh, as a protagonist, because like she's not going to be able to beat a man in a fight with just her bare fists, right? So again, all of it is set up to, to feel small and, and like you, you aren't in control. And um, Cultist uh, provides you with a variety of starting results depending on what legacy you're playing as, um, but always it's very deliberately mean. So uh, you will never start off with a healthy stack of health and a bunch of money in the bank and a bunch of resources that you, you can experiment with, um, particularly in the first legacy, which I believe is specifically designed to kill the player, to introduce them to the idea that that firstly death was was part of the game and, it, and you know then it introduces you to all the other legacies you can play through which is you know important for the player to know but also to remind them that you are playing in this big Lovecraftian world and as anyone who's ever engaged with, with the Lovecraft mythos knows it's not about punching a big monster in the face and, and and setting things on fire I mean you can do that in certain incarnations of it but really it's about this massive world that doesn't care about you could crush you in an instant and, and you have no way of interacting with. You, you, you can see it at the corner of your eye and you can be uh, impacted by it. But if you ever engage with it head on, you will absolutely be crushed. But what I wanted to say is that Lovecraft is an influence and a starting point. But one of the big differences between mythos stuff and cultist stuff is that you are going to get crushed, probably. Uh, uh, but, um, you, uh, you have the opportunity to be one of the forces that do the crushing. So in, in, in uh, the mythos, the universe is huge, cold, empty, and full of uncaring forces. In Cult of Simulator, the universe is huge, warm, full, often of things that wish you terrible pain or, or, um, or, or at least a very different um, agendas. And... Um, but I think that the, the, the key thing that, that you said is is that you are going to die or you are going to pass the world in some way you get to choose the manner of your passing well and I think you've got the constant you reminder in the UI of the timer ticking down um, yeah, and, and yeah, you know, course, the, yeah. the hourglass is one of the first icons that you see and then of course that, that's got a strong association for most people with, with mortality in some sense of the word yeah. and then and then you get the, the burning cards um, so the burning cards 
I was going to just explain to people who may not have played it that there are some cards that have timers on, and when the timers run out, um, there's very little you can do to, to stop a timer or, or pause it, and you certainly can't reverse it. Um, and in most cases, when the timer runs out, the card burns up and is destroyed. So you have an opportunity to get a similar card later down the line, but you've lost that forever. So, so my preference when playing a game, because I basically am a bit of an escapist, is to hoard and get loads of resource and then have quite an easy time of it. And I feel like the grind is, is part of the fun and the reward is when I can be relaxed and have an enjoyable player experience where, where everything kind of goes my way. Um, but that's exactly the control that Will was talking about. And that's what you took away from them in, in Cultists when you were designing it. You don't allow people to hoard stuff and just end up with a massive stack, which breaks the, the sense of like, actually death is coming for you and there's nothing you can do about it. And you make a great point. Sorry. I was going to say, I remember the, first, the, the burning card. Um, the first time I saw a corpse in real life, which was, was oh. my grandfather, um, I didn't realize, long ago, I didn't realize, I didn't realize, very few of us see dead bodies very often. So I found on the rare occasions I have, I kind of keep expecting it to move. So all the dead bodies I've seen are people in films and they're acting mm. and they're going to get up. And all the people I've seen lying still in real life have been asleep and they might wake up at any moment. So seeing a human shape and realizing it's not going to, um, it's not going to move ever again, really messes with your expectations, your ideas about how humans behave and what they do. And I want to do something similar with, with cards. You have cards in a game, you, you hold them, you stack them, you deal them, you spend them, you gain more. Um, unless you're playing a legacy game, cards are never physically destroyed. So when literally a minute and a half into cultists, for the first time you get a yeah. card that's going to disappear, it focuses your attention. It and really I think that's does. one of the ways you make death feel like a thing in a card game. Well, I was going to say, you know, the point made that about the passage of time is like so clearly linked on some primitive level to our fear of mortality. And it reminded me a bit too about stillness of the wind and like the shortness of the days and, you know, I mean, how much the, there is and the pressure you feel to get things done. Um, yeah. And exactly. also the, the, the shortness of the days coupled with the fact that your player character is an old woman, right? And when you get into the end of your, the end of your life, I'm, I'm, I can only imagine, but um, you know, the, the, that, um, that I, I guess, like thinking about death, might be be more of a, a common occurrence and when you're younger. Um, so I, I think it's interesting um, when um, Alexis and Lottie were talking about um, like teaching the player that death is in the game, uh, which was important for their game. But in stillness, I purposely um, didn't teach the player. Right, I wanted it, I wanted the player to be um, kind of not sure whether your character can die or not, at the same time having death kind of lurking everywhere in the narrative and even, you know, on the actual farm, there's this, this graveyard that's just outside of your farm that's not explained what it is. It's just there the whole game, you know, and it's kind of casting a shadow over the whole game. So that, that ambigu uh, ambiguity over whether you can actually die, I think for me was, was quite important. And um, one, of the, one of the major themes in... in Stunners was actually um, like lack of agency and, and trying to um, get that feeling across to the player. And I think um, having this old lady with the days going by and you're trying to keep up your chores and you, you can't do it anymore, you know, and death is everywhere, the shadow of death is everywhere. Um, just for me, it was kind of really interesting to, to explore that and kind of, um, you know, in, in terms of the mechanics that it has, it almost pretends to be a survival game. Um, and I've heard from, from players thinking, you know, because you, you have to eat every day. And, you know, some players feed, um, kind of eat the food every day in the fear of they might die, but they're not actually sure whether the game would actually, it's going to be that cruel to them, right? And actually, uh, and this actually, walking simulator wouldn't kill me. Exactly, exactly, exactly. I think that's why the goat, when the ghosts die, that's actually the most, it's quite shocking because you kind of, you don't expect the right inside, like, okay. Yeah. Well, and the art style yeah. is so like welcoming. I mean, it's certainly, you know, it's, it's bright colors, it's this warm yellow. Um, when I was playing, I certainly felt that the main character had lived a very full life. Mm. Um, so even though it's, it's isolated and um, very simplistic, what, what her life now is, I didn't feel that it was like, she'd had this grand ambition she hadn't fulfilled. It felt like she was in the place for her. And I find it very interesting that towards the end of the game, um, 
when it became apparent that maybe the tide was turning and there wasn't that much I as a player could do. Uh, I, I, I really like the fact that you went almost metaphorical with it. Um, you started using the motif of crows very heavily. And one of the one of the most striking moments for me was one day where there were just crows over everything. And that was the first time that the game was really telling me, like, this is bad. The world is no longer this sort of safe little haven that you're in control of with your goats and your cheese and, and, and the shrine and all the beautiful stuff that, that I can do. Now, actually, this is hostile. And it was a whole environment that, that was suddenly shifting, as I, as I think maybe that's how it feels. Um, obviously, I, I'm not an old lady yet, but I wonder that, that when you do start realizing that actually it's, it's now a significant... Uh, a significant lack of actual time and you could theoretically about if you start thinking how many years do I have left yeah. I imagine that suddenly does change your perspective and things aren't yellow anymore they are grey and covered in crows it occurs to me both of you Will and Kajan um, your, your games so I, I still haven't played actual sunlight as I was saying to Will beforehand because I'm, I'm waiting but I'm feeling strong enough to do it but my understanding is that towards the end of around yeah <laughs> So at the end of the game, the, the main character trashes his apartment. Is that right? Because that's right. Yeah. Much. And in um, in the place of the goats are, and I see you also in Stillness of the Wind. You're in this lovely autumnally coloured cottage with a fence around it. Mm. So you've got your space, and there's the outside world. So mm. there's a sense of sanctuary there right from the beginning. And I think, you know, death we think of as something outside our houses. Yeah. And it's when it comes into our houses and we start losing control of our immediate space. It's Beowulf again. It's Beowulf, yeah, it's that d, d but you know. I mean, I, I think what's interesting is the feeling I got is that I feel like home is a place where you die, but that it's the saddest place to die alone. And when it, it became clear to me that that's where this narrative was sort of headed, um, you know, it became that much more poignant that she was alone there. That I feel like home is the worst place that you could die without the p other people who should be there. And it was, it was a really beautiful thing to sort of build towards. And I mean, I, I agree that it, it didn't really tip its hand early on because it was, did have that very beautiful painterly style. But I always feel very aware of seasons. And I think people are as well. And I think as you begin to see the atmosphere turn, you know, from, from summer into storms and, and other sort of weather phenomena, you know where anything that starts in summer is going to end. And, um, you know, that, that is indeed where, where it does end up as well. And I feel like that was really beautifully handled uh, in the game uh, in Stillness because it didn't um, get there too early. It truly did save it for when it, it, had, it had the greatest impact. So um, th these, these are all great. And um, that, that is not as good of a segue, perhaps, into our next question, uh, which is the, on the topic of death versus fun, which, of course, is... <laughs> We, we have established already that death is maybe not that fun a topic to address in, in games, but where do, where do each of us sit on this in terms of, you know, I guess, on, do video games have to be fun? Can death be fun? Should death be fun? So on and so forth. So, I mean, everyone on this that. panel has talked about wanting their players to feel a variety of dread or misery or, or, or whatever negative emotion that certainly I think new designers would, would never think this is something that, that you design for. And, and we've got whole industries, particularly and in mobile industry set up to, to ha give people kind of sugar packed, super fun, quick instance, like adrenaline rushes. Um, and I'm, I'm playing a bunch of uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey at the minute, which of course is about being an assassin. So I have murdered like hundreds of people by this point. Um, and obviously I can't actually die. Even if I do die and reach the end state, it's a desynchronization. So that is a kind of like, uh, neutralizing of, of death to begin with in a game that is all about death but it's never presented as a sort of do you actually want to think about the fact that you're murdering people it's, it's purely a uh, this is fun this is what you're meant to be doing and all the people that you murder well not all of them but a lot of the people that you murder tend to be the classic video game murdery i.e really bad news and, and the classic is you know go go shoot some nazis no one's going to grieve over, over dead nazis right and and in this case there's lots of like oh i i am a big scary greek man and i have just beat a child and then the main character's like, oh great, I don't really feel bad about having to stab you now because you've proven that you're a bad person and somehow this karmic justice is, is in my hands. Um, so I think that there's nothing intrinsically unfun about death, but I think it depends on what the player wants from the game. Like, you, nobody plays Assassin's Creed to contemplate mortality, but people probably play both of your games and your game 
because they want to, to be a little bit more meditative. And I don't think necessarily they open up a game in the hopes that it will make them feel better about their own inevitable demise or that it will clarify one of the most complicated issues in, in human history. But I do think that people don't come to these sort of games for the quick adrenaline rush. They come because they want something else, something a bit more meditative, something a bit more like literary and, and kind of artistic, I think. I think there's, that's true up to a point, and I think it's, it's quite a, a significant point. But also, um, you know, fun is a slippery concept, and, and we've already invited the game designer curse by mentioning Dark Souls once in this conversation. But I think a lot of people describe Dark Souls as fun, and I think everybody knows about Dark Souls, and you die constantly. And people play games for escape from life. They play them for lots of reasons. They play them to socialize, they play them for challenge, um, all, all these other things. But the thing, you know, I often sit down in front of a game because I've, a, I've had an um, intense day at work and I want to do something that takes me away for a bit. Yeah. And there are times when I feel like playing a, a meditative literary game. There are times when I feel like shooting and being shot at. And both of those things sometimes involve death in very different ways. But the thing is about when I use death in my work, especially when it comes to the mechanical side of it. The Sun of Sea is, 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 is set on a vast dark ocean and all the islands are points of light. And the reason for this design choice, and that's sort of you know, everything from the resource level to the art direction, is that you really care about the points of light when you get there. Yeah. Every time you get to an island in the middle, there's a sense of relief and there's a sense of excitement. And I think death in games very often functions like that. It's a thick black border around the outside of the experience you're having. So if you achieve something in, in Dark Souls, um, then you, you really care about it. Uh, because, you know, you, you've, uh, leaving the difficulty debate aside, I think people should be able to tune the games to their difficulties they prefer. You know, it's the sense of achievement that you chase. And even, Will, with, uh, and Kajan, with your, your work, you, you, you like taking agency away from people, but you don't like taking all the agency away. No. When they do have agency, they're going to care a lot more about it. Mm. So, you know, a lot of the time, death in a game is like winter in life. Um, I, I can't remember who said this, um, but they said something along the lines of humans think they enjoy winter, but they don't. They enjoy the experience of being proof against winter. And that feeling of being in a warm coat or by a fire in a storm is like nothing else. I think very often death in games has that effect. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I agree. I think, um, you know, death isn't the most fun topic. Um, but then again, I don't, I, don't, I don't think games have to be fun, you know, in, in the strictest sense of the word. Um, like you, like you both said, you know, there are times when you want something that, um, requires maybe a bit more of your energy to engage with and, you know, it'll make you, um, think about your own mortality or whatever. And there are times you don't, right? I know personally more often than not, it's, I don't want that, right? I, I, I don't have the energy to engage with that kind of stuff. Um, and Alexis, that's why you, you were apologizing, apologizing that you haven't played, um, our games because you just haven't you you weren't in a place where you felt like you you could could engage with that and I think that's fine. Um, I, I think it's it's just it's just um, healthy overall to have options, right? I mean, um, games which are designed um, to you know that just don't you know will, will not deal with these kinds of things and they're just designed to be fun. That's great, you know. When when you're in the mood for something fun, you can go play that. And if not, you can. You know, I think now that we're seeing people kind of um, make these kinds of games that, that will forego fun in the name of trying to um, do something um, a bit more involved. Um, well, I, I think that can only be a good thing, right, for, for the industry and for, for um, people to have options. Um, that being said, I, like Alexa said, you know, it, death isn't the antithesis of fun in video games, right? I think if, if, if the main core theme of your of your game you know, was death, then maybe it wouldn't be that fun. But obviously, there's plenty of fun games that do involve death, um, so they're not exactly opposed. 
Um, but I think fundamentally, at the end of the day, um, it, I, I think now that we're in a place where, you know, developers have the option to make something fun or have made something that's, um, you know, definitely not fun and not intended to be fun, but it is intended to, for something to chew on. Um, I think that's, that's just better for everybody, right? And for me, in terms of thinking about fun and death, I, I sort of took the tack that, you know, games don't have to be fun, but they do have to be engaging and working in really, really heavy, heavy ways that I do. The thing that I often use to, to I guess, inject some kind of quote unquote fun, if that's what you want to call it, is humor. Like, I think, you know, especially if you're making games that you want to seem realistic and you want to reflect real human experiences in real life, you have to understand that there are things that are, that are funny no matter what. And you can use it also to set up interesting contrasts. Like in actual sunlight, there's a lot of humor early on. And one of the reasons I do that is because there's no humor later on. But without that contrast and without those two different kinds of engagement, I don't feel like the second would hit as heavy as it could. So I tend to think of fun almost as like a jab and then the complete lack of fun as a cross. And you can do that. And there's a lot of things you can do uh, with fun, even in games that you know you're not setting out to, to make fun. So that was, that was just my little thought on fun there. And that, no, I agree. Uh, yeah. Please I mean, go ahead. I'm just going to say that that you know we talk about um the pros uh at weather factory as as, as nasty but funny and um, funny but nasty um for exactly that reason if we had 110,000 words of, of of horrible kind of you're going to die and you haven't got any money and then you've murdered all your friends then that that wouldn't be remotely fun uh, or certainly we wouldn't know how to make it fun but we have you know the, the jazzy brightly colored art we have a bunch of very funny text we have a bunch of um amusing anecdotes in certain books that kind of throw a bit more uh light uh, light-hearted prose about that isn't all about murdering and and betraying people and, and whatever for exactly that reason because yeah if, you need it right yeah i think i think i think that kind of mirrors real life in, in the sense that um you know death is sad because we like to be alive right yeah. and we like we like to have people around us which are also alive um so i mean like death only makes sense in in in, in contrast to life so i think the fact that like, the games have to kind of mirror this in order to to be engaged i think is is uh well not not surprising to say the least i really like the jab and then the cross as a as a metaphor i constantly think of of writing and game to the nasty but funny thing is exactly this sort of you know you you put somebody there so you can put them back here and and and, and um, I think a certain kind of player really enjoys that um, that hot yeah, then cold and I mean, in, in Little Red Lion, my second game, it's one of those stories where you go back and forth between two player characters, and it's almost exactly like that. One of them is a very sad story that the player is very much meant to empathize and identify with, and the other one is supposed to be completely wild and unrecognizable to most people's real lives. And it's occasionally funny, but it, it, that wildness and that madness really sincerely augments the more realistic stuff because you're, you're, you're being whipped out into space and then ripped back down to earth um, rapidly and you really feel that contrast. So, so serious game makers out there, don't forget to have your jokes and your good times and your high style. And speaking of high style, that's another, this is a good segue into our last question. And this one's going to be a little bit of a lightning round because we are running out of time. But the question simply is, why are we all so goth? <laughs> And credit to Lottie for these questions. These questions are all her, and they're all amazing. Don't blame me. No, no, no. So, yes, wait, it's um, I am goth because uh, what is better than the rain on a wilting rose laid upon the tombstone of a tragic lover? <laughs> I'm goth because my dad uh, drove his plane to the sea. <laughs> Uh, yeah, by accident, so funny, nasty. That's when I when I was two years old, and then my brother killed himself twenty one years later, uh, and so my family has been, uh, you, you know, uh, it's had some 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 odd times. And I think this comes back to the nasty but funny thing. You write about death, or you make games about death, if you have had experiences with this. And uh, you know, I know, um, uh, Will, you, you've talked about depression. I've, I've talked about depression. Um, if you constantly think and worry and feel about death, then putting it in games 
is a way to get under control. And being a big old goth is a really good way to get death under control. Because if you think of gravestones as decor rather than a beacon of your inevitable end, then you feel a lot better about it. Mm. That's, that's really interesting. Because I, I actually, um, I've been fortunate to live my life so far without actually anyone, um, anyone close to me having died. So my, my knowledge of death um, is purely based on media that I've kind of ingested over, over the years. You know, some of my, my ideas and thoughts about death are quite abstract and basically just theory. Um, so I have no idea why I'm, why I'm so goth. <laughs> I have no right to be. <laughs> And I, I don't think I, too. It's okay. I, I was not goth in high school. The thing with me is I'm becoming more goth as I get older. And I realized that everything those goths said about the establishment and the man and, <laughs> and money, it was all true. It was only supposed to be true in high school. And then things were supposed to get better, but they did it. They got worse. So now I'm goth. I'm going to be, I'm late thirties goth. I'm loving it. I'm doing it. And, and on that note, we're just about out of time, but everyone, please, uh, let's go around one more time. Please let everyone watching know about your games, the sales, and uh, how they can connect with you. All right, so we've got a big old goth game. It's a Lovecraftian card game called Cultist Simulator, where you bring the apocalypse and end the world. Um, it is, uh, I think it's quite good. It's been nominated for a couple of BAFTAs. You can buy it on Steam. Um, you can find a free demo, if you're not sure, um, at the bottom of the Luda Narracon page. And we have some new DLC coming out on the 30th of May. So now is a great time to check it out. Try the demo, it's not for everyone. Cool. Um, so, Stillness of the Wind is on sale right now. Um, I've actually got a little documentary film that's streaming on the game page. Um, so check that out. It's a little bit of a behind the scenes on what I was thinking about um, while making it. Um, yeah, it's about a goat herding grandma. So if that sounds up your line, go for it. And if you're interested in awesome contemporary narratives about money, honesty, depression, uh, and all those other wonderful topics, you can check out Actual Sunlight and Little Red Lie, both of which are on Steam at, at great sale prices. And if you don't feel like giving me any money at all, you can go on mobile and get my latest game, Guildmaster Story, available on iOS and Google Play. But uh, I would start with Actual Sunlight, and if you like the first five minutes of that, I guarantee you're going to like everything I've ever done and ever will do. <laughs> and that's about it. That's all we have time for on the Death and Games panel. Thank you again to Luna Nericon, uh for a great session, and thanks to all of you as well. Thank you very Thank much, you. Luna Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Stay tuned for more from Luna Nericon. <laughs>